So if I can ask people please to um, take their seats. Now we have got quite a bit still to get through. So what I'm proposing is that we next do item 19, implications of the organics processing plant closure. And that then we move to item 12, the South Library earthquake repair options. And they're the two, what seem to be the two big items on the agenda that we're going to deal with next. And then we've got a number of reports and um, more regular items to deal with after that. So let's now turn to item 19, implications of organics processing plant closure. Um, and let's start with a presentation from staff. And then obviously let's move as we normally would to questions. And then we'll get something moved and seconded and then we'll um, continue from there. All right, so um, over to staff. Thank you. Put your mic on, Jay. We're reporting back on the request um, to do some analysis on the implications of closing immediately the, um, uh, the OPP as we look for and seek a partnership for a replacement um, organics processing plant. Um, Lynette will um, make the presentation today, but we've got um, a team behind us, and Ross is here as well to answer any of the technical questions um, at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Kia ora tato. I, um, I'll kick straight into the presentation. Um, so, as you're aware, we've been processing organics material, cubeside organics material, at the Romney site since 2009. Um, and we've heard from the Bromley residents and we've heard from them this morning about the fact that the odour in the area is having an impact on their wellbeing. Uh, they've identified both this organics processing plant, as we've heard today, um, and more recently the wastewater treatment plant, as we've heard about. We have heard some conversations, uh, some st um, statements today about working within our consent conditions and the, the type of the consent that's working. So I just wanted to clarify the consent um, allows for uh, um, indoor operations, so the, um, I'll get the words correct here. The processing and receiving hall is sealed and is under, under negative pressure, and that is where it, the material comes into. It is um, put into the, into the tunnels to start the composting process. The screening process is inside a shed, but that is not under negative pressure and there is outside windrows. So that is in, um, the, the advice we've had within the um, bounds of our consent. So that's the process that is being undertaken, but over the last um, number of months, we have undertaken a range of processes to try and manage and mitigate the odour from the site as part of our transitional plan. So I just want to talk to that very quickly. We, have, we are looking to, um, and we have, maintained effective treatment of all of the processing air, so it's running through the biofilters, including the air coming from the um, screening shed. We um, have also undertaken biofilter maintenance. That was done last year, this time last year. We've ceased accepting pre-consumer pre food organics. That, that happened in December last year. We are now uh, using a probiotic probiotic additive in order to accelerate the maturation of the compost. We've cleared the windrows of maturing compost. That's over 30,000 tonnes of compost off the site. We do acknowledge that there are still piles of tailings on the site, but all the processing does now occur indoors. It is the, the maturing, out, it is the, it's the piles of tailings that are outside and we are moving a lower maturity product off site within 48 hours. So there is, we, we are continuing with our community liaison groups as we um, are required to under our consent. And we are looking at other options. And one that came up recently was the consideration of the removal of tailings from the site, or we need to consider enclosing more of the operation. So that is all about compliance and, and what we're doing right now. Um, with regard to the request around the implications of immediate closure of the OPP, that would require diversion of organics to landfill. Now, 
terminology could get a bit muddled there, but we would be taking all the cubeside organics that we collect in the green bin to a, to a landfill site. The cubeside organics would no longer be received at the Living Earth Organics Plant, and they would need to be processed through some form of a transfer station. We, in, in providing this information, we have talked to a number of parties, including Cape Valley, Living Earth, Eco Central, Central Government, Ministry for Environment, and Waimakariri District Council. And I think we'll get into that as we go along a bit more. So if we were to take um, all the organics to landfill, that is taking 55,000 tonnes of organics that would need to be transported up to Cape Valley. It's a 140 kilometre round trip. There would be over 2,500 additional truck movements per annum. That is calculated, at, so a return trip is two truck movements. And each of those trucks would have two of those big blue bins on them. Um, we believe that, oh, we, the advice we've had is that will trigger a change to the current resource consent for the Cape Valley operation, particularly noting around the truck movements. Now the other thing that will occur is there will be implications of increased biogenic methane creation because there's increased organics in the landfill. So the other thing that we that the Living Earth site wouldn't be doing is taking commercial waste streams and they would no longer be taking, so we, they, they process, that site processes 5,000 tonnes of organics from Waimakariri. That would need to be transported to landfill as well. So there is a cost implication of this decision for the Waimakariri District Council rate, rate pays as well. Um, we have heard from the community, we uh, have had our community meetings and we've heard from them at these meetings and we've heard from them in other venues um, that this plant is affecting their quality of life, it is negatively impacting their health and wellbeing and it is reducing their house and property values and that this impact has been ongoing for a number of years. We have heard that and we, we are working very hard to try and work through this. If the plant was to close tomorrow, they are clearly telling us that would give them some respite. So, the other considerations we've brought into this report are the cost implications. Um, there are uh, one-off cost implications that would be impacted in uh, the next financial year, starting 1 July, and in the year after. There is also an ongoing 12.7 million per annum on the costs for the residual waste charges to go to landfill. That is the gross cost. What we will, what we then have considered as offsets is capital improvement changes in the capital pro, um, improvement funding, but also the organics processing budget. So that's how we've offset it. Um, overall, the funding mechanism is a is an increase both in the gen in the general rate but a decrease in the targeted rate. The net cost estimation with one-off costs and 6.1 million per year works out at 28.5 million if it takes us three years to resolve this situation. The rates impact for that is an increase of 2.7% on rates. I've written that down here. Is 2.7% on rates next financial year, starting 1 July. The year after that increase is slightly less, but it is 1.23% every year. So that stays on. 1.23% is on per annum until we resolve this. 1.5% on top of that for the one-off costs next financial year. What we haven't added and factored into this is the environment court costs should ECAN take um, enforcement action. We will come to this Brent's online to uh, to talk to um, the ECAN situation. Uh, and the potential loss of the levy, um, which is in the order of 
it is eight hundred eighty three thousand dollars. The other consideration um, we brought, we looked at, was the policies that this is inconsistent with. There's a number. The Waste Minimisation Act is the first one sitting at the top, um, and our Waste minim Minimisation and Management Plan that was developed in 2020 and agreed in 2020. Uh, the Autotahi Resilience Strategy, which aims to maximise composting or organics and of organics, it should say, and reduce transport emissions. And the recently released Emissions Reduction Plan from the Government, which really focuses on hygienic methane. Greenhouse gas emissions um, and the climate change impact of this. This is the um, impact of the additional transport. Ross, did we, is, this doesn't take into account biogenic methane? No, no. no. So it's an additional 274 tonnes, let alone any bio methane that may be generated as well. This is where I'm going to hand over to Brent if I can. Is he, is he there? to talk to these two slides, a couple of slides. Yes, I am. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, just give me a moment while I turn my screen on. Okay, so um, ECAN wrote a letter to the council, um, which the council received on the 23rd of May, um, which stated an ECAN staff opinion um, that um, ODA uh, from the activity at the Live, Living Earth site is in breach of a resource consent condition that requires there to be no offensive and objectionable odour beyond the boundary of the site. And as a result, um, the um, ECAN letter suggests that um, the staff opinion is that the Council's in breach of the abatement notice that ECAN issued at the end of 2020. Um, which required the council to ensure that there be no offensive and objectionable odour beyond the boundary of the site. Um, the, the council's own um, independent odour expert disagrees with that assessment by ECAN staff. Um, so the council is going to be engaging with ECAN about this. Uh, the council still has um, that consultant and others um, engaged for proactive odour assessment and reporting. Um, the, the letter from ECAN, it's um, it doesn't change anything in relation to the staff recommendation on the report. Uh, the council has known that EGAN has been actively looking at enforcement options for um, for several years now, actually, and that included the abatement notice that I just referred to. What's what's new about the current situation is that the EGAN staff assessment seems to be that ongoing low levels of odour can amount to an offensive and objectionable adverse effect. Um, so that's that's a, a new position that um, this council and ECAN obviously need to explore in some detail. Um, we'll, we'll, be ex we'll be engaging with ECAN on that at an operational level with a view to um, seeing whether those concerns can be resolved. Uh, what's the next slide, slide uh, Lynette? Legal considerations around um, termination of the contract. Mm. Uh, so, um, as was highlighted on, I think, the title page for this presentation, um, it's about um, the costs and implications of termination of the contract without cause under the contract. Yeah. And, and there would be a, a cause to terminate the contract if um, the council considered that the operator was in breach of their contractual um, obligations. As the council doesn't consider that um, the, the current owners are in breach of the resource consent conditions, it would need to be a termination without cause. Um, so that would require a negotiated um, agreement to terminate the contract with the current operator. And on top of that, referring to the final bullet point on this slide, um, not only uh, is there an ongoing enforcement risk at the current site, but there will be, of course, if um, if odour is generated at the transfer stations through the alternative proposal, being that instead of there being processing at this site, the organics are moved to the transfer stations. That means uh, potential odour implications 
and further enforcement risk from ECAN in relation to the activity at those sites. Thank you. Thanks, Brent. So those are the considerations that we've put into this report. Um, and the process for decision making has been assessed and the decision, the, any decision regarding this is deemed to be a significant one and, and have effects across the whole of the city. And the advice we've received is that we would need that to consider a closure decision would require citywide consultation and consultation with mana whenua. So in summary, this is a very complex project, just another one for you to consider today. The closure and transportation of organics to landfill would also impact Wamakariri district. Um, the climate change impacts are considerable in what we're talking about and a decision to close immediately does go against council's own policy as well as government policy. The OPP can't be immediately closed because we don't know the views and preferences of the general public and mana whenua. However, not closing the facility does mean the stress for neighbouring community will continue. I do want to finally just point out that our recommendation is to, staff's recommendation is to continue as per your previous um, resolution to work expeditiously to achieve finding a new solution. And staff are focused on that and achieving that, that does take a significant amount of work too. So I'll put it out for questions. All right, thank you. So now moving to questions. Jimmy and then Jan. And two questions based on your presentation. First one, the regarding to external uh, the consultant engage for proactive auto assessment reporting ongoing when? What's the time frame this report will come out? It's ongoing. We're getting it all the time. So we've got it now. We re already receive. Yes. Yes, we, we get, we get monitoring. The monitoring is constant and we get it regularly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know. But, but our view is different from the ECAN view, am I right? Yes. To bridge those, those yes. kind of resource concept. Yes. So still negotiate. Our, our you, you, it's a different from EK. I'm sorry, Councillor, I don't understand the question. Our, our monitoring, yeah, our monitoring, our expert yeah. is monitoring. Yeah, it's different from there. It's different from their monitoring, yeah. yes. So the, <coughs> not yet the, have a compromise. No, not yet to get an agreement. We're still working through the through the process with EK around the abatement notice. Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. So yes. when when we get a, get a result, when? We don't know. Yeah, no, we don't know. We're working through that. Okay. Second uh, is uh, regarding to the, uh, the com community, you know, affected rest in particular, concern those health and the well-being, etc. But based on all the medication, uh, at the moment, it's kind of a green light or it's a red light or a yellow light at the moment regarding to the health and the well-being. Sorry, can you repeat that to me? Sorry. I, I mean, the, 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 this uh, kind of old door, you know, actually, you know, is create, you know, those the, the, the kind of the health the issue or not a moment, or just a psychological one. So we don't have any evidence that the odour is causing significant physical health issues. Yes. But we do acknowledge that there is stress and yeah, psychological health issues, maybe if you want to call it like that. It's probably more stress related to the odour. Yeah, but have any evidence you know, actually is affected their health, health issue? We evidence. Have, historically, we have had the medical officer of health, and this was a few years ago, yes. um, and we received a letter from the medical officer that, that they. Um, considered there was no um, uh, impacts on the on the health from the organics processing plant operation. Okay. Okay. Thank you.
Thank you. Yanning. Thank, thank you. Um, <clears throat> just just want to check, because um, we've had reference to the letters. So like we've been told some of the content that's in them. Are they, is, are they able to be released? I'm just a bit unclear because part of what we've been presented with is information that we've got that the community hasn't seen. And given that staff have referred to them, um, I, I don't know how much I can refer to what's in them. That sounds like a question for Brent to answer. Thank you. Um, yes, I, uh, I think it's probably okay for the letters to be released, um, but I'm not going to give any legal advice in the context of this public meeting about the council position on those letters. Cool. So we can refer and ask questions about what's in the letter? Cool. Okay. Uh, uh, Councillor Hanson, I just want clarification. Brent, for both letters or just the original one from ECAM? Um, Two from ECAM. There was, there were two letters from ECAN and there was one reply that went from this council back to ECAN. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd be pretty relaxed about them both That's being fine. in the public domain. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And of course, if there are questions that are asked that are not able to be answered in the context of this meeting, you'd be making that clear at the same time. So, Yanni, does that lead to questions? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Um, so... Uh, staff will be well aware, I did put these questions in ahead of the meeting um, when I got a copy of the two letters, but I haven't had a response. As local councillor, I asked if staff could keep me informed on a weekly basis of notices of non-compliance to kind of get a sense of how bad things were in the local community around people reporting and the ongoing enforcement and monitoring. Uh, what I didn't realise, um, that although I was being advised that there were zero notices of non-compliance being issued, and thinking that this meant that the problem was improving, that in fact council staff had asked ECAN not to issue notices of non-compliance, and to simply report those instances to council when the odour was noticed beyond the boundary. So the question I have is why were we not advised of this as elected members, and how many times did ECAN contact us and I think the community would want to know as well, how many times did ECAN contact us instead of issuing a notice of non-compliance but advising that the odour was beyond the boundary? So just to clarify, there are some um, sections of the letters that we dispute and we haven't had a chance to dispute them yet because they only came in yesterday. We did not ask ECAN not to issue notice of non-compliance and in fact we, we can't ask ECAN to do that. We did have a conversation about the fact that it was how we were working was unhelpful. We, we've been trying to work together with ECAN. So we did not ask ECAN to not issue notices of non-compliance. They did say at the time, following the 1 February notice of non-compliance that they issued the day after the finalisation of the, of the abatement notice period, they did start issuing weekly updates to us on when they have noticed smell. So what a notice of non-compliance would be, which is all that a notice of non-compliance is. It is, a, it is an ECAN officer out, out in the community going, I've smelt a smell and I believe it is coming from the organics processing plant. So, okay, whether or not, I mean, they say they um, were requesting so, They, they did advise that they, um, the notice of non-compliance on the 1st of February was withdrawn because that, uh, our staff requested to withdraw the notice of non-compliance on the 1st of February. Um, and while ECAN said they advised that they would not be withdrawing the notice of non-compliance, they did agree to provide us with weekly updates of confirmed odour rather than issuing further notice of non-compliance. What I'm trying to understand is why no one informed the local councillor who had a request in to be told when these... Um, odours were a problem, and why when we go to a community liaison group that there's no information as to um, the compliance? Because we get told that there's no notice of non-compliance as though everything's fine, when actually there was this agreement that the community, I don't think the community knew about, and I certainly didn't know about, as local councillor. Why wasn't that disclosed to people? It was disclosed to people at the community meeting. All of the information about the complaints was given to the community ahead of the community meeting, and you as a local councillor were given a copy of that as well. 
as were the other councillors for the area. So all of the all of the notices, and that is all in Ecan's report that you got as part of the community liaison meeting, and it is it's available on the web page. And as you, as we read in that, there were fifty one instances across the three month period when. 51's right, isn't it? 51. Correct, yeah. Instances across the three month period of when odour was detected. Now, this is this is comes down to the conversation that Brent was having before about whether we agree that we that it is offensive and objectionable. And that's the difference in the conversation that we're having here between us and Ekin. You're right, it was mentioned in that report, but that report was the 15th of May. Between the 1st of February and the 15th of May, when was the community or, or local elected members advised that notices of non-compliance were no longer being issued? We found out they weren't being issued at the same time you did when we got the letter. Okay. We never asked ECAN not to issue notices of non-compliance. They went through a different path to work collaboratively with us so we were issued with weekly updates of... Okay. Do you, just, do you, do sorry, you know... just to be clear, so um, the letter does refer to us asking them to withdraw the notice of non-compliance that they issued in, in February. On, um, we asked them to do that on the basis that our expert evidence contradicted the evidence that they were relying on for issuing that notice of non-compliance. Yes. Right. And, that, and that conversation still stands, and we still haven't had. So they are still going through the process of understanding, but we still haven't had any formal update of the outcomes of, as a result of the abatement notice that ended on the 31st of January. Yeah, but from now on, ECAN have said they're going to start issuing notices of non compliance again. Which effectively is no different to what they've been doing for the last few months by giving us a weekly update of when they've yeah. smelt an odour. Cool. And just... um. I presume you've seen that the time frame that ECAN have attached, where um, you know March 2020, Bromley Oda pilot started, 24th of April, um, Environment Canterbury present to CCC, findings of the Bromley Oda pilot, findings show Living Earth is in breach of its consent, and that those offensive and objectionable odors were substantiated beyond the property boundary. Goes on to say CCC were initially reluctant to accept the findings and requested an adaptive management plan to be implemented for three months. Um, September 2020, Environment County recently led a CCC stating the adaptive management period plan is now over um, and that there was no noticeable reduction in odour um, and that regulatory function would resume. November 2020, CCC was still reluctant to accept the odour issue and got independent research company to survey the residents. Um, in December 2020, ECAN issues us with the abatement notice. Um, requiring offensive and ejectable odour to cease. Six and I mean, you read through it, and it just feels like the council's just refusing to accept, reluctantly um, acknowledging that there's a breach of consent. And I get the letters yesterday, and it still seems like we don't accept that there's a breach of consent, even though the ECAN evidence is really clear. Why, why do we not accept that there's been a breach of consent? So since the um, abatement notice was issued last year, we have put in a transition plan and significantly changed the operations on the site. Um, and we are still open to talking about further mitigation measures should they be required, all that come with a cost. So, you know, we've got to be mindful of that because it's the city ratepayers that are paying for that. We're continuing to talk to ECAN and using independent specialists to monitor on our behalf odours. So what's changed since that history, and I don't know if I can confirm that history or not, we, obviously that's ECAN's view on it, but certainly in the last year we have significantly changed the operation um, in an effort to reduce any odours beyond the boundary and certainly any offensive odours. Until February 1st, does Council accept that we've been in breach of the consent? Um, it, 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 we're no. not, no, we, won't, we won't say that at this point, no. 
despite all the evidence that ECAN's got and all the complaints that the community have you, You've asked the question, Yanni, and you've had the we answer. We accept that the community has um, believes that there is offensive odours. We accept that the community is quite right to have the views that they have found uh, from time to time those odours offensive, whether they are test of offensive in law or not. At this point, as staff, we can't give you that advice. We have had feedback from Environment Canterbury that um, through the period of the abatement notice when we changed the operation, that there has been significant improvement. But we had six infringement notices that were issued between November and December 2020 and January and May 2021. Not, not infringement notices, I don't think. Right. Okay. Um, I mean, I'm just staggered that we don't accept that there's been a breach of consent. Unreal. We, All right, have you got more questions, Yanni? Yeah, I just well, wanted to check. Um, to just, uh, oh, right, okay, because we... Okay, so we've lost the Zoom connection. We've oh, got... Megan's going to do something fancy, hopefully. So do we... Can, can we continue regardless Please of... enter the meeting passcode, oh, right, followed by the pound sign. <laughs> so it was just notice of an interruption. <laughs> yes. Okay. Does this indicate we're reconnected? Yeah. We're, we're just keen to get um, Brent back on the call before we um, proceed. Hi, everyone. I can hear you. Oh, uh, wonderful. All right, great. So, Yanni, did you have um, further yeah, just, questions? Just two more questions. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, oh, and it, w it would be good just to, um, as an aside, just get an understanding of if the 6th of April letter was circulated to us or... Um, before yesterday, or whether that's the first that we'd seen it. Certainly the first time I can recall seeing it, but we may have had it in briefings before. But just just two other questions, thank you. Um, I, when, I, when I read through, and I, I hear what you say around all these different policies and requirements to consult, and um, you know, we'd be going against certain things, um, but what takes precedent? Does the RMA take precedence over you know, being compliant with the RMA take precedence over all those other strategies. Um, Brent, do you want to answer that or do you want us to? Right, yeah. Can you just basically be non-compliant with an RMA because you're compliant with all these other things? Like what comes, what overrides what? Um, I'm not too sure whether I follow the question, oh. Councillor. Oh, sorry. Um, but, let, but, 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 but let me summarise what, what I think might be... Um, the situation you're addressing. The council's obliged to perform all of its legal obligations and they often interrelate and overlap. So the council is obliged to perform its legal obligation to comply with resource consent conditions. And the expert advice to the council is that it is doing so. Um, if the, uh, um, in another area of council activity, if the council wants to make a decision um, and it doesn't know the views and preferences of the community, then it needs to comply with its lawful obligation to learn the views and preferences of the community. It needs to perform all of its legal obligations. Thank you. So, sorry, just, just to be clear. So basically, um, you, you don't have to, um, like, like the RMA is a legal statutory it's a really direct question, Jan. Yeah. You so, can like, ask that'll get the answer you're looking for. So, basically, for. Um, you can be non-compliant, but you still have to go through a massive process to consult your community, even if, it, if the outcome was that you're still non-compliant. Like, why do you not have to comply straight away, or within a sense of reasonableness, with something that's a that's a legislation of New Zealand? Like, why would why would a council policy or strategy override a New Zealand stature? Um, the, 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 the question is, um, 
a little bit mixed, Councillor. Let me try and unpick it a little bit. First of all, ECAN has written a letter to the Council saying that ECAN considers that the Council is in breach of an abatement notice and that the Council is in breach of resource consent, a resource consent condition. And ECAN's letter says that ECAN is investigating what to do about that staff opinion. Um, and ECAN has a range of enforcement options open to it. That's, that's an expression of opinion by the regulatory authority. The council as the holder of a resource consent also has its own opinion and its opinion comes from its expert advisors. And that opinion is that the council is not in breach of its RMA obligations. Um, that's a matter that the two councils need to work out. And um, there'll be a lot of work at an operational level between the two councils to work that out. In the meantime, the council's still going through a series of local government act decision-making processes to do with uh, relocation or potential relocation of the organics processing plant. Um, and if the council wants to um, consider immediate relocation um, when it hasn't got an alternative processing plant set up, then the council's got a legal obligation to go through uh, uh, consultation requirements before making that decision. So the council is going to be performing all of its legal obligations. Thank you. Uh, final question from me is that um, in the community views, it states that um, 5.23, a closure decision affects the entire district. The closure of the OPP will also have an impact on rates. The views of the wider community have not been sought regarding a closure. Um, and I'm just trying to I'm just trying to align it. And this was one of the issues that was raised at one of the community meetings. Is I'm, I'm trying to understand in my mind how for a cost less um, than the extra 50 million that we put on for the new stadium, where we didn't have to consult, which had an impact across arguably Canterbury, not just Christchurch, but certainly um, Christchurch ratepayers. Why is it that we don't have to consult on adding 50 million dollars plus to the Christchurch stadium? But on this one, we do. Um, I, I can't comment on decisions that I haven't been involved in, Councillor. I'll comment on this one, though. Um, the decision to immediately close the organics waste processing plant here means that um, there is going to be no processing of organics waste, which has fairly significant implications for the Council's waste minimisation objectives and um, the Council's obligations under the Waste Minimalisation Act. It would be appropriate um, for the Council to obtain the views and preferences of the community about not only the costs to do with the closure, but also all the other social, cultural and environmental costs and benefits that flow from that decision. Thank you. I've got Jake and then Pauline. Jake. Um, so if we're not in, in breach of the resource consent, why would, why would we bother moving to an alternative location? Um, so that was a decision that um, you as a council made, and it's partly it based on the fact that the, na the, the residents around that area have made a case that the presence of the organics processing plant and the history of it has caused them stress and continues to cause them stress. That sprung out of a decision, a, a report to upgrade, remember? And so it was. It was still a staff recommendation to move the, move the, uh, the site. So, second question is um, uh, around the costings. We were talking about the the cost of uh, compost to remediate the adjacent site. Did we look at um, at that, and is that is that being factored in if we were to not do that for a period of time? Yes. Yes, yeah, so that's, that's part of the costs. Right, that's yep. been factored in. Yep. So just to clarify that, um, there was $2 million attributed to the cost of distributing compost to the wastewater treatment plants. Yes. And right. there was some informal discussion around whether that was, whether the benefit to that arrangement was primarily as a, disposer of compost or whether the wastewater treatment plans actually needed to spend two million dollars a year on compost for landscaping purposes what was the answer to that question um so both needed that so we needed that to 
um, remove the windrows from the organics processing plant and the wastewater treatment plant um, operations need that to establish vegetation around the ponds to deal with the midge issues. So the implication of not spending $2 million at the wastewater treatment plant on compost would be that the midge issue would not be remedied and would be exacerbated. That's right. Great. And the $2 million figure was arrived at by looking at what the replacement cost of that compost would be yep. if it was no longer available from the organics processing plant. That's, That's right. Great. Thank you. Um, Pauline and then Aaron. Pauline. So forgive me if I've missed this, and it's probably in the previous report, but we've got a report coming in February about um, relocation sites and, and relocating mm -hmm. a yes, we have. Yep. When that report comes and we make a decision, do we then have to consult on that? Um, Brent might be the one. Depends on the decision. How long? Depends. If, if, if I may, I think it would depend on what, what the outcome of that report says. If we decided to um, relocate the plant and build a new one, so close it, basically relocate it. It, it depends on, the, on, on what... On what that, on what that looks like, and what we're trying, what what the other resolution was that you you approved at the last one was to move into a procurement process mm -hmm. to have those conversations. So that report in next February is the outcome of that process. So it does depend on what it looks like, but it would be looking to um, to achieve the same outcomes. So it has a lesser impact than closure, immediate closure, and taking the green waste to landfill does now. So that's Potentially what not, to... but possibly. Um, and then my other question is, um, Bruce King mentioned that the tailings that are on the site are, are such that they take up about 25% of the, the space that the land um, windrows were, which seems to me it's a considerable amount of tailings. Yeah, so, so yes, that, that's right, we do have tailings on site and as we've mentioned, they do feed into the process. Um, as you would have seen in the slides, one of our, our next part of the transition is looking at removing a lot of those tailings and we're just working through what is the best options there. Um, the, uh, there is contamination with plastic in those tailings that have been through the screening process yeah. so we are limited as to options there um, with the last resort being landfill but we can move some of those tailings into the receiving hall but not, not much. So um, can you op could the plant operate with, with none of those tailings there? Just get it, rid of all of it? It requires tailings as part of the for the process so the incoming uh, food organics waste from your green bin um, needs that porosity of some material. So if it's not the tailings, we'd have to actually bring in other material. And it's also mm. the carbon nitrogen mix to to um, uh, for the composting process as well. So it is a requirement, but we don't need as much. So we're looking now as to how to re reduce that amount of tailings on site. It, have you got any idea how much you could reduce it by? They'd probably need about two to 3,000 tonnes on site as part of their operation. And that's one of the mitigations. We've, we've looked, talked about a couple of further mitigations and one is enclosing the site more. And obviously with a reduced footprint of the tailings, that would be a reduced cost in terms of the coverage that we'd need to look at in closing that operation. Right, so how long um, is that work going to take? We, we're working through that now. We're looking for other options, um, but otherwise it's, like I say, it's, it's, it's most likely we're gonna to have to send some of that to landfill. Yeah, but I mean that's not such a significant uh, step as taking the whole fifty-five thousand tons. It would be taking maybe what seven thousand tons or something. Correct. Yeah. Um. Yep. So. And it'd be a one-off. Yes. So we'd be looking to have right. a cycling okay, price, cycling and process. And so, have have you got no idea of how long that piece of work's going to take? Could it be done in a month? Or oh, to move the physically. No, to identify what you're going to do. Whether we, you're going we, to remove the tailings or cover them or uh, 
cover more of the yep. area? So, so we're working through that now. Uh, I suppose part of the, the, the uh, why we haven't done anything sooner is because we've had the independent experts say that the operation that we're currently operating is compliant. Right. So we haven't seen the need to be shifting that. We understand, listen to the community. Uh, yep. It was brought up at the liaison group meeting last Tuesday that that was a concern. Um, so now we're looking at that, what can we do? So um, we, we're working through that now. And so let's say we fast forward and in, in a few weeks' time you've got the tailings largely removed and what's left is covered. Are you uh, confident that that will actually have an incredible effect on reducing the odour? Look, all, all those things will further reduce. And uh, as mentioned, we've, we've been sort of looking at, you know, there is a cost associated with that. Certainly enclosing what's remaining won't happen in the next month or so. That, that's quite a significant um, investment if that's decided. Um, but we can remove some of the tailings. So if, if we just looking at enclosing, that would mean obviously building a, a building over it or a structure. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and then when the site has originally um, changed its use, so the organics processing plant wouldn't be there anymore, that would still be, would you think it would still be an asset for council? So we're not actually wasting money if we did that? Yeah, and that's part of the consideration that what, we, what we're what we building, whether it's, if it's a temporary, um, then obviously it's not going to add much, too much value to the sale of the asset, but if it's something more s significant structural-wise, yes, that will be an asset that would be adding value. Right, OK, that. but in, also in that consideration, I hope you put in speed in there as part of the criteria because... If, if you went for a permanent structure but it was going to take 12 months to build it, that's no good to us. So I guess that you've, you've been looking at this through a legal lens and um, a compliance lens, but we're now putting we, our governance people, political lens over it, saying, look, we have to do something. And we, so We do need you to know that we're trying to put every lens across it and we are hearing what the community, as staff, we're hearing what the community, we, we're hearing it directly. Yeah. We're sitting there in those meetings. We, we're hearing what the community is saying, mm -hmm. and we are trying really hard to expedite this process. Mm, good. I think. Thank you. That's all my questions. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah, a couple of completely different questions um, because the ones come up around the moving the compost down to the um, water treatment. What's being planted there that needs so much compost? Because that ground around there's had thick green grass and cows for years, and I'm oh, sorry, that's not our project. Oh, Helen. Oh, Helen. We've got a range of trees and shrubs going in there, and the compost both helps condition the soil and keep the moisture in there because it can be pretty hot out there. Pretty hot. Mm. Right. I would have thought a windbreak would be more benefit there than compost, but. The compost is being spread to 300 mils yep. and helps enormously. Okay, and cool, so that's that's that one. Because I thought when we got told about that project, it was a chance to unload all the backlog of compost, not that it was going to have to go on for years and years. In terms of the outcomes, it's a win-win. So it helps the backlog at the organics processing plant and it brings forward the planting program at the wastewater treatment around the ponds. Right, right. And so, right, OK. Well, the answer to the previous question suggested that whilst there's a dual benefit, we would continue to need at the wastewater treatment plant the same volume of compost, regardless of the fact that there wasn't a dual benefit to the OPP if it wasn't coming from the OPP. Yeah, would either need compost or some other mulch or use carpet squares or whatever whatever else you can do to help help those new plantings. And what's the area that we're spreading this compost over, the land area? Sorry, I haven't got that at my fingertips. Okay, no problem. There's a number of areas um, around the ponds that we're, that we're doing it. And have we considered what a lower cost option might look like if we didn't have the compost available from the OPP? No, no we'd simply do it on a slower programme. So then a, a clearer way to ask the question might be then, because the council uh, currently plants around a million shrubs and trees and plants a year, which is considerable, uh, and uh, do we use this much compost everywhere else? I'm sorry, you'd, you'd need to talk to the parks people. I, I don't know about the other planting programmes. 
I would have thought not. I've not they seen do, that. They do. They do use a range of approaches. They do use it, yeah, depending on yeah. on what the um, what the circumstances are. Yeah, as, as you can tell, this is an area that some people are, uh, are keen to get a better understanding of, of mm. what we're doing, why we're doing it, and whether if the dual benefit was no longer available, we would continue to do the same thing. Yeah, thank you. And then the other question um, goes back to this this morning with the um, why not use the airborne spore traps. How can the medical officer of health say that there's no um, negative health effect if something like those spore traps aren't out there to know because if you go to Oderings now um, and there's a picture of the medical officer of health telling you to use gloves and a mask when you use compost. So you'd need to ask the medical yeah. officer of health that question. So did they have evidence that there is no... There is, there is, there is, in the report to the community liaison group, there's, there's an update on the dust implications and a, and a report that was done from Aiken. So that, that is all there. It showed there were no, there was no linkages between the compost and the... And the dust. And the dust. That was, okay, thank you. Thank you. Jake. Um, what would the effect of a slower planting program be? <laughs> Sorry, <coughs> I should have. She's gone. Um, yeah, so the midges will be gone slower. Right. All right, Melanie, I'll come to you next. Thank you. Um, a season four point two um, about there's no current um, availability in other um, facilities to take our organic waste. Um, is there any capacity to take some of our organic waste at other facilities like Salwyn or somewhere else? Uh, not not immediately, um, but potentially Timaru might be able to take some uh, going forward. Um, so is Salwyn at capacity already? S Salwyn, uh, their operation is just wind rowing. So um, and the discussions we've had with Selwyn that they wouldn't want to receive our material, but would complicate their operation. Okay. Yeah. So so no 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 other capacity for another operation to take our material at the moment. Okay. And then the other question is um, talked about a lower maturity product being moved off site off the OPP site within forty eight hours. I was wondering. Within forty-eight hours of what? Coming out of the tunnel. That's that's have been screened. So the process that comes out of the tunnels and is screened, uh, and that generally happens the same day. And the reason it's within forty-eight hours, if it sits any longer, there's a chance that it can start to go anaerobic. So generally, it's removed the same day. So once it's screened, the trucks come in the next day and it's taken away. So is it outside before being shifted off site? Yes. So it is. So there's tailings outside, but there's also lower maturity product that's potentially outside for 48 hours as well. Yes, that screen product that would sit outside as well. Okay. Yep. Okay. Sarah. Thank you. Um, I'd like to flick to the, um, the potential for upscaling alternative um, community-based solutions um, and the presentation that Bailey did both today and... Um, and last year, and it sounds like the, the trials have been successful. And I think part of that was a report back um, on the potential for partnering to enhance and upscale that. And I'm wondering um, if that report back is coming soon, um, if we could give some assistance by way of resolution today, those kind of things. Yeah, yeah. so Rowan's been dealing yep. directly with them. Yeah. yeah, kia ora. So I actually went and saw the 2020 uh, operation start of this week, yep. start of this week into last week. Really positive stuff happening out there. They've just converted their um, land holding into a lease, um, and so they're really able to ramp up their operations. You know, as Bailey described, they can now they've got capacity to take about three thousand tons, mm. potentially. Um, the issue with with their operations is they need a pre a pre treatment. You know, if they were going to take curbside organics, it would still need to be treated before it was spread into those windrows. So we are working with them to understand if there are options there. Um, at the moment, they're taking commercial food waste and blending that with public drop-off garden waste and public drop-off flax leaves and, and, and the like. So whilst there's opportunity to, to partner with 2020 and other community-based composting initiatives, yeah. it's not um, viable to take 
you know, a significant portion of the curbside green waste. Yeah. And so I guess if we're looking at scaling back operations at the organics processing plant, we need more facility than, than just those existing yeah. Um, opportunities. Yeah, but, um, but it was clear that he thought that they could scale up over a relatively short period of time. It's not, you know, the immediate closure kind of thing. Um, but it's also something that we, that we know that ongoing, even when, once we have a new facility, will still be of benefit to the community. Um, and so I'm wondering how we're able to enhance that. Yeah, so, yeah. so the part of the procurement piece that we're about to enter into is to look at all of those opportunities. Yeah. Okay. So not just to look at building a new facility or facilities, but also to understand if we can separate the waste stream, if a certain facility might take a particular part of the waste stream and, and those types of uh, options, I guess. So rather than just us going to market and asking for a final solution, it's going to be that more iterative process where we are actually looking for how can we rethink how our organics, you know, flow through. Yeah. And is there any um, potential to, and I don't know, it doesn't solve everything, um, but as we know with the whole part of things, there are no silver bullets and we need to do a whole range of things. Um, do more of the, the home-based composting. I know that well before I was elected at a pre-quake, council was doing a lot in the Wakashi space, all of those kind of things, that kind of stuff was really available with lots of education, getting those food scraps done at home um, rather than all going into the green bin and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And, and those, those points were raised you know, at the, at the last councillor meeting uh, and taken on board by our team. Uh, we've obviously got commitments in the waste management minimisation plan yep. to promote the reduction of organic waste, and part of that is their at-home treatment. So, you know, that's definitely a work stream that our team is putting together yeah. in terms of promoting home composting, making it easier for people to home compost um, and addressing those inner city properties that don't potentially have gardens and, and want an option for, for organics processing at home. Yeah, and so um, resourcing for some of that, um, will that come to us relatively soon for, for some of those things? I mean, we, we're clearly keen to work on this and um, not adverse to to investing in um, ways of uh, minimising waste and reducing odour and all of those kind of things. Um, so in, in the past with those things, we've been told, oh, there's no resource, we don't have enough kind of thing. So is that going to come to us? You just said we're working on it. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's part of our action plan, so it's part of our forward programme of work. So we've got waste minimisation budget to oh, achieve yeah. those, those Okay, activities. there is enough budget to do it. Cool. Thank you. Tim. Thank you, um, and I'm, you may have covered it, and that's probably to Brent. Um, on the page with regards to organics to landfill, and where it's saying it's, there's 2,756 movements, and obviously that's full one way, empty the other, um, and it will trigger a change to the current resource consent. The, the term it will trigger a change, there's no guarantee that we would be awarded or it, it would be accepted. Your comment on that? Agree. Um, I haven't looked in detail about the merits of the resource consent application um, or what the processing by the Huanui District Council is likely to be. Um, but um, I, I was um, involved around the edges when Cape Valley was first established. And one of the primary issues about establishing Cape Valley for the local communities was the truck movements rolling through their towns. Um, so I would expect it to attract a bit of interest. Yeah, you know, I'd imagine there'd be a lot of pushback with regards to that. But so if, and I mean everything's going so well for us. If, for instance, that it wasn't um, um, approved, um, what would be the conversation around the, the discussion with regards to taking it somewhere else? <coughs> and I, sorry, you don't have a crystal ball, nor do I. So that's probably why I'm asking you. <laughs> um, yeah, I will struggle with that one a little bit, Councillor. Um, <laughs> I, 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 don't, I, I don't know whether there is anywhere oh, else. So, um, I'll, yeah. I'll pass, pass that on to the technical Co folk. Councillors, we're not aware of anywhere else that yeah. would be consented that could take the waste, the organics waste. Yeah. And the consent yeah. at Cape Valley, um, I mean, this is pretty unequivocal, it will trigger a change to the current resource consent. We know that their current consent would not be able to accommodate the additional truck movements that are described here. That's right, yes. Um, so we know that for a number of reasons, but one of the reasons most recently is we know that the um, truck movements associated with the wastewater treatment plant work uh, and emptying the trickling filters will also um, 
be outside their consent, so they'll need to vary their consent to allow those much less truck movements. And I believe that when this was first up, as, as Brent alluded to with regards to the truck movements, it wasn't just Amberley, it was, what it, it was every community that they went through. It's quite significant, so thank you. All right, thank you. Are there any further questions? Yanni. Um, just, just to pick up on that, um, we obviously one of the submitters talked about the issue of rail, using rail. And um, so I just, you know, I, I guess when you reflect on the challenge, you've got a regional waste facility that's already established that's operating for the red bin, the rubbish and that um, other things. Um, and I know I put the question through, but I just think it would be really good to get an answer is if we wanted to directly procure um, or, or choose a site like Cape Valley and say, in principle, that's where we want the relocated site to go to, um, and we just want you to get, a, get on and sort out the logistics of transport, um, of technology, um, and how it can work with presumably the existing operator. Um, what, what stops us from doing that today, just making that call directly? The, um, the procurement rules and guidance and the legal feedback that we've had is that we shouldn't, we, we can't do that. We also don't know that that is the best solution, long term, best value for this community to spend, as Jane pointed out before, ratepayers' money. So this, the decision about moving, and to go back and reiterate, the decision to move from Bromley is not a lift and shift. It is a look at what options are out there that are best suited to the waste stream that we have, the future for our city, and the best value for the ratepayer moving forward. But sure. So the decision is a, is, is a long-term decision. It's a 20 to 30 year decision. But so it has major implications. But there's, a health, there's a health and well-being um, factor we, as well. We understand that, and we and that is why we are doing this process to lift to, to, to move. Yeah, and just um, the only other question from me. Sorry, I didn't ask it earlier, but just um, appreciate that you've got the material going in close proximity. Y you would have heard from some of the submitters concerned that there is odor generation occurring. What processes and systems do we have in place to? check um, on what's the result of the compost being um, redistributed in the local area? Like what monitoring are we doing around odour or potential for odour around those? Around the ponds. Dimensions? Um, it's around the ponds and also is, is there somewhere else it was going? I wasn't quite sure, the South New Brighton School. Right, it's just going around the ponds. Yeah, right. so, so there was work done initially. This, this, was, this started before the wastewater treatment plant fire so the yep. assessment was done prior to that and that was quite okay. close to, to Cuthbert's Road there. Um, so once the, the compost has been um, tipped and spread to the, the depth of 300, pretty much within 24 hours it'll form a crust and it's not going it, to, there's no odours associated with that so there's no adverse effects. So that was all done prior and that, that, and that same system is what we, we continue to do now. Does that include dust as well? Uh, there's been no, uh, and this is what ECAN have reported, no no complaints of dust. And um, as also alluded to to Lynette in the, in the CLG, the, the dust that was found was not deemed to have been conclusive that it's, it's come from the, it couldn't be that it's compost come dust. from the compost facility. Yeah, again, just, um, yeah, like, now we've got those devices. You know, I, I just think in terms of, um, if there's something we can do just to provide that greater degree of reassurance because we are spreading the thing out away from the actual plant itself, it would it would be good. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I think if, if it will give the elected members comfort, we can do some dust monitoring. It will be probably not the right time to do odour monitoring around the ponds, but um, we can look at that down the, down the track. All right, thank you. The correlation of... I mean, the staff recommendation clearly is um, perfectly aligned with the previous decision that was made on the um, 26th of April, the previous resolution. If um, there was a different resolution passed that did move us along the track of um, 
closing the plans earlier. How, for, I guess this is probably a legal question as much as anything, or certainly a process question. How, do, how would those two decisions sit together, given that the decision that we make today would really preempt um, the final outcome of the other decision-making process that was put together, that was um, put in train in April? Because that was an in-principle decision with investigation to be done and a report back in February for a final decision to be made in February. If the plant were already closed before February, then to some degree the environment in which that decision has been made and the ability to make a final decision not to close the plant at that time would be passed. So how, how do the, the, the two decision-making processes sit together if an outcome of today's meeting was to decide to close the plant earlier? And what are the implications? I think that's a question for Helen, not for the team. Can I just clarify something, though? What we're reporting back on in February is the outcomes of a procurement process, not an investigation process. Yeah, sure. So it's more than just an investigation. But it is what, one two. possible outcome of that procurement process that you report back on is that the costs are so significant or the ability to do the thing that needs to be done to exit um, the current OPP is so difficult that a decision wouldn't be made to do that, despite we've got an in-principle yes. decision in place yes, to do so. Could be. If yes. we made a decision prior to February really to close <laughs> the existing plans, in some ways, that boxes us in, for want of a better expression, on that February decision. Uh, it would reduce no. your options. Yes. Yeah, so the so while so if the decision is to close it sometime before February, um, the plant would still be sitting there. The plant would need to be changed because, and that was the option that we've got still sitting on the table. So we had a design mm. to enclose. Um, that is the option that will be compared against the other options as a base case, um, if you like, if you want to think about it as a business case. You've agreed in principle to move it, so um, the, so to reverse that decision, the alternatives would have to be significantly worse than doing the rebuild as it's currently sitting on our books. So the plant wouldn't disappear, um, it would just sit unused. Yep, so the only difference would be that it was a mothballed plant, a non-operational plant that was the basis of that other decision, rather than a plant that had a contractor in place and was currently operating. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sarah. And then I'll come to Aaron. Thanks for that. Um, I know that uh, everyone's very keen to do this as quickly as possible, um, but we've heard that there are some quite clear legal risks um, in going down the immediate closure thing. Um, before knowing whether any of those legal risks would actually eventuate, which is very hard to tell, but there's a substantial risk of them, if we went to consult on closing it before we knew whether we could even legally do that, what does that do to trust and confidence from the community if we then find out that we've consulted on something we can't do? If that, does that make sense? So you couldn't close it because there's no consented alternative for the organics? Yeah, mm. those kind of things. Like if, if there was if there was actually ended up being nowhere else to put it, that, yes. um, and we didn't know that, and we went out and consulted and said, should we close it? And people said yes, and then we said, well, actually, we can't anyway. What does that do to our relationship with the community? That could be quite problematic, and I think um, you know, we, we could come back with advice on how you might manage that. I mean, one of the options would be to apply for a variation or get the consent holder to apply for a variation of consent at the same time. The consequence of that, though, would be if the community has signals to you and you decide not to close the plant until a replacement organic processing plant is established, you potentially upset the community for no reason because, and it will be, and the community north will be upset we know that from the previous um, consent process. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Aaron. Yeah, um, it's a bit of a follow-on from Sarah's points before because, I, to be honest, I don't know where this is going to land today. 
uh, and I don't think anyone sitting around the table probably does, but the um, one of the things that was really clear this morning is um, from Bailey's presentation that he sees an opportunity. And I think most people around this table have a lot of trust in that guy and, and some of the stuff he's achieved. He's done some impressive things. And he believes that we can do something revolutionary and we're at that point in time, in, in, including world leading. How do we guarantee from today that he's in the tent as much as he needs to be to make sure if that is a viable option, we go that way and just flip the whole thing on its head and go away from the industrialised version that we've tried and has now failed and we move to something else? How do we make do sure do that's in whatever we decide today? Um, so as Rowan said, um, it is part of the considerations and the project that we're now working on around the procurement um, process for an alternative. Yeah, I just want to add to that that I think as um, Ross or Rowan mentioned earlier, we are going out with a multi-stage procurement. We're not saying this is what we want. We've got objectives and requirements and we're going to work our way through that process with the market. And we might come back with more than one option or there might be one definitive option. So we just need to be careful when we are preempting decisions because you are limiting the market yourself by doing that, by giving them an indication that oh, it might be a preconceived idea that we will do this, or we can't do that. We are looking at all options. There is not just one person who can provide a solution. There are multiple people that can provide a solution. And we need to afford all of those multiple options to come through before predetermining and, just one. Yeah, and but, can I yeah. add, sorry, the way, the way you ensure that happens is giving us clarity of the outcomes that we want to achieve. And then we build that into the procurement process and we make sure that we follow good, sound procurement yeah, the practices fear, the, to ensure that everybody has a fair chance. Yeah, the, the fear is that people like him and, and groups like the ones he works with and, and others that have popped up in our city in the last 10, 12 years, they don't fit in the traditional procurement policy. They don't fit in the way that councils and governments design solutions. <laughs> They're essentially the opposite to it. Well, and sometimes they sit in on really good yeah. good yeah. solutions. So it's just to make sure that... Well, I, I disagree with that as well. And okay. that, that we, we're actively working to yeah. ensure that we're looking at all the options. So Christchurch City Council's policy is definitely one of the most that is catered best to dealing with the smaller market, the more innovative ways of procuring than just your normal tick box standard procurement process. Mm -hmm. So yeah, most definitely not excluding them at all. Um, and remember, we will be coming back to elected members with the procurement plan for you to agree to, so that's probably where you could have that debate. Yep. Okay, cool, thank you. Definitely. So just to tease out Sarah's line of questioning a little bit further, if there, were, if there was a desire to consult on an early closure, in an environment where we didn't yet know that there was any consented or consentable alternative, we would actually end up consulting on something that may not be capable of being implemented. Generally, when we consult, we work up all the details of a proposal and we know that it's a firm proposal, that if the consultation supports it and we make a decision to proceed, it's capable of being done. Where do we sit in terms of the Local Government Act or other considerations consulting on something that may in fact not able to be done mm. even if the desire of the community and of the council was to do it? Yep. I think Helen might be the best place to answer that one. Uh, yes, if, if I may, Chair. Um, so in terms of if, if there were to be a decision today um, in relation to closure of the plant, that there's insufficient information before you, including the views and preferences. So mm. we've already made that clear um, of the community as well as mana whenua. So we would need, because of the significance of the issue, particularly without a definite and, um, alternative to communicate with the community as we've indicated. Um, in terms of, so that means there couldn't be a decision along those lines without consultation today. Mm. That then would lead to another round of consultation depending on the outcome of that in relation to our waste minimisation plan and our obligations under the relevant waste legislation. But, so, so we would need to consult on changes to our waste minimisation plan, for example, but if we were going to consult... No, if, no, no, that would be the second, that would be the second step. Yeah. We've just been told we can't make the decision yes. today. 
Oh, no, the question no, is the decision around consultations. To... We can't so, consult on something that we can't do. So what I'm talking about is process. Yeah. If the desire of the meeting today was to close the OPP before an alternative was built, we clearly don't... there's consultation required. We know that. Clearly we can't make a decision today just to close it just like that. We know that. But the thing that we are consulting on in an environment where we don't know that there's a consented way of disposing of the green waste is very different than the way we normally go about consultation. Absolutely. Maybe I didn't make my question no, very you're clear. you're right. So you're right. So it would be, we would have to be very honest about that. So you would go out to consult to seek the views, but the, you would be seeking views on closure um, on the understanding, and we'd have to make that very clear, that there actually wasn't an alternative consented option for the disposal. It would be a very messy but consultation would process. It wouldn't be yeah. impossible, but so, it would I mean, be So, I mean, Sarah's messy. comments are further teasing out exactly the question I'm asking. Right. We'd be consulting on something that we don't know that we can do. That's is right. that a, Is that a valid consultation? Can I move we lie the item on the table? <laughs> well, the next step, once you'd got those views, the next step would be then to seek um, consent or a variation of the consent to enable that decision to actually be put into effect. So if the community said yes knowing that there wasn't a consented option, and we went, then went out and got a consent or not. Um, so it would be a very long process to actually close the plant Yeah. anyway. So you'd run a consultation, you'd, if it was a, you got the signal that the community was keen, we'd then ask Cape Valley to <coughs> seek a variation. You'd probably then go back and reconsult on the policy elements. Would it therefore not make sense to try and align the two decision-making processes. We've got one report coming back on February on, procure on procurement. That will then tell us how quickly and where and what and how much and all of those questions. Yes. If there was going to be a conversation about, given what we've just heard about the length of time the process that's just been described would take, would it not make sense to align the two processes, even if there was a desire to look at closing the current facility early? Would it not make sense to align the two processes? So before you answer that, I still think there is an issue in terms of actually meeting our obligations yep. under the Act in relation to the fact that by consulting, when we do not have any solution for the future, actually is difficult. So you can't. That further assessment would need to be done. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So given that we've got... So just. Teasing that out a bit further, given that we've got a report that we know is coming back, we've been told mm -hmm. there's some pressure around it, but we know is coming back in February on the procurement matter, would it, in an environment where there was a desire to close the current OPP as soon as possible, and realising that there's currently no alternative um, waste um, disposal stream, would it not make sense to consider this matter at that same time? Yes. And I guess that's me asking for advice. Yes. Just, just notice Brent's got his hand up. Um, so, Brent, yeah, thank you. Um, so, Brent, you've got some comment to make here, some advice to provide? Yeah, th thanks for that, Chair. Um, I'd like to, um, first of all, thank Councillor Templeton for raising this issue because it's something that I should have covered off in the advice earlier today. Um, it's a very good point that um, there are significant uncertainties about the resource consent that's needed for the extra truckloads to Cape Valley. Um, and it's also a good point that the consultation with the community is a little bit unusual in normal council um, practices to be consulting with the community over doing something that the council simply doesn't know whether it can do. It's not unique, though. Um, it, it does happen now and then, such as over Akarara Wastewater, um, where the council consulted with the community over options for disposal, um, saying that uh, whatever the, the chosen preference is, the council will then need to seek resource consent to implement it. Um, so it's not unique. It can be done. Um, but it is a considerable uncertainty, and it's um, going to... Um, have quite a significant re, um, outcome in terms of the actual time frame if the council was to resolve that it wanted to terminate without having or, and a, or an alternative option in place for organics processing. 
because um, as Helen was saying, there needs to be a round of consultation on the views and preferences of immediate closure. Then there needs to be a round of consultation on change to the waste management plan. There also has to be a variation of a resource consent application. Um, and variations of a resource consent application might take, for example, two years um, if um, they're not directly referred to the environment court. So a resolution to start a process for immediate closure is describing a process that is going to take um, yes. um, potential, well, well, it's absolute shortest might be six months. It's more likely to be years. Um, so picking up on your point, um, uh, Councillor Turner, it um, would make more efficient and practical sense to pull that decision-making process together with the one that the council needs to go through following the further investigation and procurement process for alternatives. Thank you. So does that translate into not making a decision on the paper that's in front of us today and considering both matters in February? Um, well, the, well, the paper that's in front of you today is uh, making a recommendation that the council continues processing um, at the current site um, until another paper comes back to you in February. Um, that, that recommendation from staff, I think, still stands. Yeah, yeah. now that's the staff recommendation. But if there was an alternative view, then it would be to refer them to refer the considerations in this paper to the um, February meeting where the procurement process is reported back. Yes. Okay, thank you. I've got Mike and then back to Sarah. Mike. Thank you. Uh, look, I, I just noted, noted in um, 3.5 of the report, obviously, if, if we were starting to um, close the plant and take everything to the landfill, obviously it has to go through the three transfer stations, one of them's right by living earth. That, that obviously requires actually some upgrades to those plants um, and potentially odours at those plants as well. Wouldn't it be better actually to spend that money to actually mitigate as much as we possibly can the odours now, including that, you know, reducing the tailings yeah. um, and building the enclosure at Living Earth, which we can pretty much do straight away instead of going through a massive long process, potentially delay it to February to then make a decision to consult. That, so therefore the odour would be, a lot, be there for a lot longer. We could actually fix it now. Or we try and reduce as much as possible. Now. So, staff advice to you is: we it would be much better to invest our time and ratepayers' money on addressing any issues with the current site in the interim, while we find an alternative site. Yes. So, even if we go through a consultation process and then support a resource consent variation process, that's all cost as well, cost in terms of time and money. Again, um, staff advice to you is that time and money would be much better spent on trying to do our absolute best for the current site. Okay, so in terms of actually... Recognising that the, sorry, recognising that the local community, nothing short of closing the, the plant now will be good enough. No, I, I understand that. But in terms of actually putting more of an enclosure at the current living area site and reducing the tailings, do you need... Um, any resolution from us to actually proactively go do that um, at, a, at, a, at a quicker rate? No, we got that from your resolution um, a month ago. So you um, you gave us authority, or the Chief Executive, I think, authority to um, invest whatever we need to invest in, in the current site to meet compliance. Okay, and I think Pauline might ask it, but I'm just trying to work out what, so what would be the time frame, do you think, you could actually get it enclosed and reduce tailings. Like, what would be the worst case scenario? Oh, we, we, we would have to come that. back with you on oh, that yeah. one. Sorry, we haven't had a chance to work that through yet. Right. All right. However, I sorry. When you consider the potential timeframes, and I know you haven't worked it through, it'd be a lot quicker yes. than actually going through um, delaying the still fair breath, consulting, and then having to build enclosures at other transfer stations um, before we look, actually close the site. If you look at the time frame that we've done up till now around the changes with the processing year, 
eating the probiotic, all of those were happening in months. Yeah. So all of these changes have happened over iterative processes over months, not over years. So yes, we, we, we're keeping working in the same way. Six months? Do you reckon you get it done by? I, I'm not going to put a t time on it, sorry. It may have to be consented if we're putting a structure on there too. So we've got building consent. Um, but if a decision but, but was yeah. made, if the decision was made to do that, you'd be able to give us a further update. Yes. yes. Um, within a matter of weeks, presumably. At least to give us an update on what the process was yep. and how far yes. down that path you were. Yes. Sarah. All right, Melanie. And the problem I've got at the moment is that we've got this letter that says that council doesn't believe we're not compliant and yet you're telling us that you want to do everything you can to make it compliant yeah, which suggested it isn't so I am absolutely mm. confused yeah sorry I'm using the wrong language um so yes yeah, so in a legal sense we believe we are compliant and that's the evidence that we have been given from our um, specialists um the view of ECAN and the um immediate neighbours um is, is different to that um, so I think what we would do is, while we won't um, admit that we are not compliant, um, what we will do is take a very open view to um, the impacts that we may be causing across the boundary. Thank so you. going over and above yeah. and beyond. Yeah. All right. Are there any further questions? Okay, so Jimmy, we're back to where we started. Jimmy and then Yami. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because, uh, because that's not the beginning of a whole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Because based on the, all the Q and the A, the staff particular mentioned you know, still go ahead rather than the too close, etc. Because so many the reverse effect. But my question is, if we we review the uh, A paragraph A point of four, here still. Highlight decision is one of high significant affect the whole city. So whether to close or not close, still need to go to the consultation with the city wide, am I right? Or not necessary. Only to close would have to go to a consultation. Okay, not, if to not keep close, open. not necessary. No. Okay, but because you why you put in here a point of four, I just don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, the requirement for consulta consultation is clear in the report and was well teased out in earlier questions. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yanni. So, um, do you know what the MFE guidelines state in regards um, to um, repeated exposure of odour, even if it's at a lower level? That's, that's, why we have our, that's why we have our independent expert interpret the guidelines and give us because I mean my under simple understanding is that um, the phyto factors frequency is actually mm. one of the issues that is is monitored around the impact yes in the in the my my understanding from the conversations that we've had recently is it is it that sensitivity to smell is also an issue and other other odors in the area is also an issue so there is it is odor is a very complex Field. Right, but it's not unreasonable for us, for us to think that if it's happening on a frequent basis, that it can be considered chronic, even if it's on a scale of one to six, not at the top end of that scale. So it depends. It, it really depends. If you would like some, um, would you? If you'd like um, some a presentation from a, from an odor expert, we can actually provide that to you. I mean, we're not odor experts, so we can't answer those technical questions. But um, I'm be more than happy to arrange a briefing from an odor expert who can talk you through the complexity of odor. Right. Okay. Um, and just um, when there's a, some resolutions, Jake, have you got? Did you want to move those or put them on? Yeah, so Mike had already indicated that he's going to move the staff recommendation. I indicated but before. If, but if there are um, alter, what's that? Sorry. So Mike is moving and Pauline seconding the staff re the staff recommendation. 
Um, I mean, if somebody wants to foreshadow um, a further resolution in the event that that fails, then obviously that's the process. Um, the only thing I need to be very clear on is that any resolution that's put, even if it's a foreshadowed resolution, um, is, cap is, is legal and is capable of being implemented so if it passes. It's, it's been provided sure it with... Is. I mean, it's staff have had a look at it, and it's, yeah. as I understand it, it's been accepted by staff as being... So there is a foreshadow. So yes. there is a further resolution that somebody cool. would like to move as a foreshadowed. Okay. Right. Okay. So we need to look at that as well. All right. So let's. Okay. So let's work up exactly where you're going with the you staff to... recommendation, um, which has been moved and seconded. But Pauline, you're seeking to make some changes to it. Do you want to take a wee recess just to get all the wording sorted? Why don't we do that? If we take, um, I mean, I'm conscious that this is taking time, but well, we need to take the time to get it right. Yeah. Why don't we take the time between now and quarter to four um, to sort out where we're going, and then we'll come back and, and debate and vote. So let's um, take an adjournment till quarter to four. Thanks um, for the suggestion. I have got a resolution on the table um, the mover and seconder between them have agreed to some additional wording which reflects some of the discussions that we've had. So that's additional um, resolutions six and seven. So that's been moved and seconded. And a change to four, adding the methods or adding the words or method. Yep. And or method. Three words. Thank you. Okay. So that's where we're at. Now, I'm aware that there's been some discussion around other alternative wording. I'm not hearing anybody moving anything or foreshadowing anything or doing anything different than dealing with this, this matter that's in front of us. So, Yanni. Jake had a um, foreshadowed, foreshadowed motion. Already seen right, that. so this is the first time I'm being told about this oh, in sorry, a formal I, sense. Yeah, okay. So sorry. I know there's wording. Do you, so you want to move, somebody wants to move that as a foreshadowed motion? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes? Cool. And does somebody want to second that as a foreshadowed motion? Melanie. Melanie does. So this is moved by Yanni, seconded by Melanie. Can we see what it is that you're moving? Okay. It was up there before. There we go. That's all that green stuff. Yeah, yeah. the green stuff. All the green stuff. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, it is now that... Pauline, so receive the report and the information contained in the report. Request staff to fully assess the costs and benefits of closing the process. How much of what's in that 2A is already covered in the report that we're considering would be my question there. Question. No. Um, right, okay. Um, undertake consultation process to obtain the views and preferences of Manifano and City. So, so if you want to take a break on that. Right, okay. So we're already in debate. So the advice I'm receiving, and thank you, Helen, um, is that we're already in debate because we've got a resolution which is moved and seconded on the table. If we wanted to take any staff advice on this foreshadowed motion, because I'm very keen to know that it's capable of being implemented if it was passed, um, we would need to sp suspend standing orders in order to do so. I don't think you do, because we, we, we checked with staff and went in the drafting of it. it. We've just foreshadowed it. I think what you have to do is put the substantive, and if the substantive fails, then you come to the foreshadowed motion. So it's not, yeah. not and then we would take the advice foreshadowed on the, motion. So yeah. you're comfortable to So it's just to let people know that this that is part. what's... On the table, All right. if this loses. All right, let's do that. All right, so we're now entering into debate on a motion which has been moved and seconded, um, knowing that there's this foreshadowed motion on the table, which only becomes an issue in the event that the motion which has been moved and seconded fails. So I'll now call for any debate. We've been through questions already. Yeah. So is there any debate? Um, so I've got Melanie and Pauline. Um, concerning um, Council's independent expert disagrees with the findings of ECAN, um, I find that um, amazing, actually. We've got that slide that says Council does not agree that there's a breach of the resource consent condition. 
I do not believe that all of council thinks that. In fact, I know that's a fact. And I know that what the community believes is something else as well. I'm astounded to read that council believes that ECAM was wrong to issue the notice of non-compliance on the 1st of February. I'm flabbergasted to read that council is listening to expert advice that it cannot be reasonably concluded that low levels of odour from the site on its own could be offensive and objectionable. I find this statement not only offensive to ECAN, but to the community and beyond objectionable. It seems to me, and I hate to say it, um, there's a willingness to design any wrongdoing. I think that we do this at our peril. If council is working with ECAN, we should stop debating the points and get on and fix the problem. Um, what I wanted to say as well is that there's a range of policies, obviously, the climate and the waste policies that we've mentioned um, that we're in contravention with if we were to close um, the plant without having another option, as well as regular legal risks. But what we haven't considered is we also have a social wellbeing policy that has not been mentioned, and it talks about living standards that are sufficient to ensure everyone can meet their immediate needs, participate in society, and develop their potential in, to live. Um, and one of the priorities in that policy is to reduce disparity. By not going ahead and closing this plant, I believe that we're, we're contravening that policy. Um, I support closing the organics processing plant as soon as possible, and if that means we must consult first, well, so be it. We need to get on and do it. Council is not doing enough to solve the problem. Action is needed now. If this was happening next door to this building, if it was happening in Fendleton, if it was happening in Higley Park, it would be shut. I've stolen Jake's line, sorry. <laughs> but the people are suffering and they deserve um, for us to get on with this. And anything less is completely inhumane. Thank you. Pauline. Yeah, I, look, I fully understand and appreciate what um, Councillor Coker is, is talking about with the consenting issues, and I'd like to put that aside because I think that the fact that we have voted in principle to look at an alternative model and site actually shows us that we're not interested in fighting this, we're interested in appeasing the community and actually solving this. So um, I can't at the moment see any advantage for anyone in going out for a consultation when we know that that initial consultation will take six months. Then if that comes back and we agree that, yes, we will pursue closing it, that will require a special consultative process or procedure. And that could be another six months. Then we have to go through all these obstacles with consents, etc. Meanwhile, it uses up all the resources and staff time, when actually I think we'd be better off investing in mitigating the existing plant. And, and we've put, um, you know, suggestions in there, which staff have assured me that they are actually already doing. They're looking at investigating, moving the tailings and covering uh, parts of the plant. Um, and you notice I've always also put in that um, the request that we support enhance the community organisations um, which have got composting initiatives so that we can reduce the volume going to the plant and that will help considerably and I think we can do that. So by continuing to reduce the odour, we will be addressing the community wellbeing issues. Um, well, and while continuing to do the right thing environmentally and in line with our climate change targets, because that just does not sit well with me, taking it all to Cape Valley, even if we could, and we don't know that we can. And even if we could, we don't know when that would be. So um, when we looked at this um, upgrade option, when it came to the TWEE committee in, um, in November 2020, I was really recommending the upgrade option because I knew to move it would take years because I knew the history of Cape Valley and that took years and it's the consenting issues that hold that up. However, when the cost flew out from the 21 to the 39 million, we had another look at it and thought this is an opportunity to appease the community by moving it and look at a different uh, technological model that could be more um, up to date. So that's the path we've gone down. And that's because the community wants it moved off that site. That's where we're going. We are, in principle, moving it at this stage, pending the report in February. So to actually slow all that down and, and waste resources, in my view, on a consultation 
and a, a huge long process on something that we don't know what the outcome is going to be, to me is not the right thing to do. Even though it sounds like it is, it would be good to do it, but I don't think it's going to give the best outcome to the community. So I'd rather use that time and resource and staff resource to uh, mitigate what's happening now. And I'd also like to, I'm glad I asked for this report because it's given us a really, really good understanding of what's involved here and the complexities of this project. And I really want to thank staff for actually having this report to us in the one month that we asked, I asked for it. And I know it's a lot of work, so thank you very much. Thank you. Aaron. Thank you. I'll just quickly touch on a couple of points. Uh, the first one is, for those that haven't gone down and tasted this, uh, it's not that pleasant. And I say taste because if you stop at the Dyers Road garage, um, like some of us do now and then, to uh, grab a pie or an ice cream, uh, you come out and it leaves a, it, you can actually taste the air. It is that, that bad. Um, and so I feel really, really, really feel for the residents that live around there and the people that work in the area during the week as well. Um, it is... It's quite an offensive odour, not as, it's quite different to the, the other plant down the road, but um, this has been there for a considerable amount of time. Uh, and I, I, I look forward to actually in this, and you'll see the wee change in four, that staff will look to expedite a procurement process for an alternative facility and or method. And we got a good heads up this morning from two different deputations. One uh, mentioned something that's dear to my heart, and that's um, why are we not composting at home? Why do we give someone a green bin to go at their gate, but we don't give them a recycle bin to go in their house, which is not going to have a carbon footprint at all? Let's be really smart and let's get the kids back at school right through the entire community back into their recycling at home, at source. Uh, so that would be the first. And then the other one is the, um, the claim that Bailey Perryman made that he believes we could be world leading. And that's what we should always, as a council, aspire to be, especially when it comes to environmental, and in this case, social issues. So um, the sooner this is fixed, the better. And I look forward to hearing back on seven as soon as possible to get those tailings out of there, because we've let them down in that community on that as well. Jake. <laughs> yeah, it, um, it seems kind of obvious that we would that we would close this plant uh, as soon as we can. Um, we're, we're quite frankly in the wrong. Um, and when you're in the wrong, you have to stop it. Um, you know, it's not acceptable. There are no qualifiers that say that because this is expensive to do, that, um, that we don't do it. And there are no qualifiers to say that just because it's Bromley, it's less important than any other area of town. Um, and there are no qualifiers to say that just because we're currently making this, these, this community's life hell that, that's any more acceptable to continue to do so. Um, so in my view, we're just plainly and simply wrong and, um, and we need to go out and, and consult on, on closing this plant as soon as we possibly can. And to not do so would be just absolutely shameful. I think the question you all have to ask yourselves is if we could save 40 million or, or 30 million, depending on how long this takes, by dumping all this stuff in Hagley Park, would we? Of course we wouldn't. Sarah. Thank you. Um, I wasn't going to speak, but um, my mother's favourite saying comes to mind um, uh, after listening to um, Councillor McClellan, and that is that um, two wrongs don't make a right. This is really, really tough. Um, this has been incredibly tough for the community for many, many years. But the, the solution that some want today, which is to close it immediately, is also not the right thing to do. Um, there are no easy decisions here. This is not easy. Um, but we need to mitigate as much as possible. Um, the recommendations today are quicker to lower the odour. It will take years to close this down with consenting issues and all of those other things. And in fact, the consent for Cape Valley isn't even our consent to apply for a change mm -hmm. to, and it isn't our council that will process it. There are no guarantees on that whatsoever. The recommendations today are also better for the environment. Um, significantly, the production of methane is really bad. Methane doesn't get produced um, with composting, but it does in landfill, um, and that's not good, as well as the um, soil and moisture retention benefits that that brings. Uh, and it doesn't divert our staff from the key priority, which is moving the plant. And we really need to get that done as soon as possible. Mm. This is not easy. 
um, but there is no simple wrong and right. Um, there are many of both, um, and two wrongs don't make it right. Celeste. I just want to acknowledge um, the people that have come and spoken today. I know it's, you know, it's hard having to come in and say the same thing again and again, and I recognise that, you know, it's, um, it's a really distressing experience. Um, and we know that there's an issue, and I thank you for drawing it out to our attention, um, and I'm sorry that we haven't been listening. I know that we need to take action now. However, I also don't think we can do the wrong thing for the right reasons. We need to not. We know that shutting down the organics part immediately without our alternative solution has significant implications, and we have obligations to reduce our emissions from transport methane. But we also need to support residents by every means possible while we move as quickly as possible to solve this issue. So that means taking action now. We need to take all necessary measures to mitigate the odour. We need to invest in home comp composting larger scale commercial composting. We need localised hubs for organic waste. We need a city-wide campaign to reduce food waste. Um, and we need a relief package, I think, for residents to support wellbeing. We need to work with our communities co to co-design a solution so that they can rebuild faith and trust in us that we're taking them seriously. We're gonna take action now. I'll come to you to close the debate. Um, Yanni. Cool. Thank you. Um, in a ke te mahu ko ko a ko ko wai ko e anga mai ko e hea ke te mahu e ko ke te anga atu ke hea. That's a Maori proverb that says, "If you know who you are and where you are from, then you will know where you're going." As a young boy, I lived in Bamford Street in a small workers' cottage that was old and cold, and every day I walked the length of Garlands Road past the unpleasant and obnoxious smells from the industrial sites over the busy railway tracks and across the narrow Apawa footbridge through Hanson's Park to school. A journey of interesting, perhaps enjoyable experiences for a 10 year old, but as a grown up, as a parent and as a city councillor, a journey that highlights to me the importance of representing an area that has a number of competing interests that impact on the well-being of our community across the economic, the cultural, the social, and the environmental spheres. And while one's perspective may have changed with age, one's memories of what they experience can mould them in to who they are today and why I'm here on this council. Being sick, suffering from asthma because the air I was breathing was no good, because the place I was living wasn't ideal. That's why I'm here, because environmental inequity exists in our society in the poorest neighbourhoods throughout our city, and it should not exist at the health and well-being of our people. So I think we do have an obligation to address the issues that people have raised. And it hasn't just been since March 2020, as ECAN have put in their timeline. This issue has been going on since this plant was first located here. But it, even in terms of joint monitoring between Council and ECAN, we said we would work together since 2015. And every single year since we agreed to do the joint monitoring project with ECAN from 2016, with a formal resolution, has been a struggle to get this council to accept that there is a harm being caused in our local community. That is not good enough in my view, and that needs to change. And I take huge exception to the idea that we are not in breach of our consent. MFE's own guidelines state, classification of odour effects is chronic and acute. Acute and chronic effects are covered by the definition of effect under the RMA, which includes temporary, permanent and cumulative effects depending on the different combination of FIDOL factors, offensive and objectionable effects can be caused by high intensity and or highly unpleasant odours occurring infrequently or for short periods, and or low intensity and or moderately unpleasant odours occurring frequently or continuously over a longer period. That is exactly what has been happening on this site. Both of those apply, we are in breach of our consent, I am on no uncertain terms, and the idea that we cannot go out and consult on something when we've got a report next on this agenda for a library that doesn't have enough money on budget, that's gonna be consulted on next year, and we're being asked to make a decision to rebuild it today, 
while we're told we can't make a decision to close this plant, I find it offensive and objectionable. Okay, no further. Oh, Jimmy, and then I'll come to Mike yeah. to close the event. Jimmy. I'm not eloquent like Yanni, you know, a good speaker, but uh, I think uh, this is the significant, the crucial, and also the, this contentious issue because we heard from the, uh, the community, uh, affected the residents of, uh, several times, but also we received the, the staff officers' comprehensive the, the, the report in here. But it looks like they have two total diff, different, different the, the kind of the situation. So make a decision very, very hard. But because I, I think the process justified should be very, very the, the, the crucial. Because this, this kind of refer issue is not happen one day. It's actually is extension for several years. It's even though it's more uh, longer. But we in the community affected resident side. We today we heard from them the deputation. Also we heard from the the uh, officer the comprehensive report. One is affected their quality of life. Second is a particular crucial. Yanni mentioned earlier negative in uh, in impact their health and the, the uh, well being. So this one is quite a quite a uh, the serious because this a kind of physical, mental, or psychological one for uh, several years or even a long, longer, etc. However, the other side, we, we are all aware, you know, if one day we, 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 if we shut down, however, increase the bigger the cost, inconsistent with the council, the waste management minimization plan, even bigger impact from all the climate change the strategy, and also the need to negotiate uh, with the you know current uh, the contractor the living us etc. But uh, like I mentioned earlier, because this one, if we make the decision our own, I think uh, probably you know best we still go to the those uh, consultation the process let the public uh, because of this is significant contentious issue you know affected probably the city wide uh, interest in affected resident community. So that's why if we review the uh, the original the move and also the this the shadow, they want difference is whether consultation or not consultation. The racial part probably the ninety five percent is exactly the same, but because due to the uh, the those parts justify, I, I would like to you know, go to the, the the this whole shadow the, this one. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, I also um, use the gas station on Dyer's Road from time to time, and I've also smelled that smell. I think maybe may even seen you there, actually. Um, and I have smelled that smell from time to time, and I think that's the point, from time to time. Whereas people that live in this neighbourhood um, have obviously got that to deal with on a far more permanent basis. And, you know, again, I acknowledge the, the community members that we've heard from once again today bringing us the same or a very similar message to, to the one that we've heard a, a number of times in the past. And what that leads me to is to want to make immediate improvements to reduce or to remove this odour. That translates into, from a technical viewpoint, removing the tailings, covering the plant, um, reducing the volumes. And if home pot composting and some education and promotion around home cost composting has got a role to play there, then that would be entirely appropriate as well. And at the same time as we're doing all that, we need to be absolutely expediting the permanent removal of this plant to a new and suitable location. And we, we put our staff under some pressure to bring a report back on procurement in February. Um, and from what we've heard today, I've got every confidence that there will be the ability to make those decisions in February. On the other hand, um, the proposal to consult, um, a consultation, the proposal of which um, would be around uncertain outcomes in an environment where a consented alternative um, doesn't exist, is not known, and around which there might be considerable lack of confidence or considerable lack of certainty. Um, I'd like to acknowledge um, Pauline for bringing this matter to the table. 
Um, had you not requested this report, we, we may not have had the opportunity for what actually has been a, a really good discussion this afternoon. It's teased out some, some facts around the, the alternative to what we were um, intending doing or what we are intending doing. Um, it's been a good discussion that I hope leads to greater understanding um, around the table but also in the community about just how complex this matter is. Um, so all of that leads me to support the resolution that's in front of us um, with, I think, the particularly useful additions that have been made to it. Mike, I'll come to you to close the debate. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Um, yeah, look, I, I'm sure um, the community there listening that came online today would have, would have loved for us to be able to say, look, let's just close it straight away. Um, but, but I think the reality is making that decision will actually take, um, has not a short process and will take considerable time. Um, and that whole time they'll be left with, with the, the smell that they currently have by actually trying to focus, by focusing on actually the, the new site um, and also focusing on actually mitigating the smell that currently is there even more with removing the tailings and um, covering it, actually it will have, have a quicker effect than actually trying to close down the, the plant. Um, I, I think we also need to remember that councils work in three-year cycles, and it's, it's this elected council um, that has made the decision to actually um, find a new site. Um, it was this council that actually had a look at seeing if it was possible to actually shut it immediately. Um, and the information we've had, um, actually, it, if we went down that path, it would take too long. So what we need to focus on is how do we mitigate that smell as much as we possibly can and actually have a a focused lens on actually getting a new site operational as soon as possible because, you know, it, it, it's not fair what these people are having to live through. Um, obviously, the um, wastewater fire, the plant, um, has caused a new smell, but this has been an ongoing smell for some some time now. Um, and and um, it is not good enough. And we need to see what we can do to improve uh, the well-being of people in that area. Um, this resolution actually, although it may not be what the community hoped for, is actually going to create a, a better outcome quicker than trying to close something that we know is actually going to be a struggle to do um, quickly and will take a long time to happen and will need us to build more facilities in different areas, which we could just focus on doing that work now. Um, I, I think um, another good thing about this is the fact that actually we've asked for a report to come back to council. That keeps it in the public eye, to, so you can see what we're doing and when we're making decisions. So um, I, I hope other people um, support this and actually realising that we're trying to do this um, for the community, um, with the community's interest at heart, and actually trying to create a, a, a solution and outcome that actually is the quickest one to achieve. So I'll put the motion. You put the one separate. Can you just put two Three. separate? So what, sorry, Yanni, what do you want two put separate? Just, just two separate. Put number two separate. Yeah, thanks. All right. So I'll put number two first then in that case. And then I'll put the... Yep. Yeah. Indeed. So I'll put um, resolution two first on its own. All those in favour say aye. aye. So we're doing a division, Andrew. Division. Oh, right. So we'll... Okay, so we'll just take a division on each of them then. Okay. Just, two, just number two first. Do you only want a division on number two? Not. Uh, okay. Right, so we'll take a division. Councillor Chen? Yes. No. Councillor Two? No. Councillor Poker? No. Councillor Cotter? Yes. Councillor Donovan? Councillor Davidson? Aye. Councillor Goff? Yes. Councillor Johansson? No. Councillor Hewan? No. Councillor MacDonald? Yes. Councillor McClellan? Uh, no. Councillor Scandrich? Aye. Councillor Templeton? Aye. Uh, Deputy Mayor Turner? Yes. Uh, Mayor Daza? Are they counted or not? No, so we'll need to, sorry, we'll need to go through and um, uh, with, with feeling. Um, 
Um, <laughs> 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 my apologies, sorry. Well, my apologies, I thought that um, was So I'll map them off. So if we could do that again, please. The mayor? Yes. Uh, Deputy Mayor Turner? Yes. Councillor Chen? Yeah. No, this is just paragraph two. No, no. You're a no. Sorry. Councillor two. Councillor two. Sorry, cut off. What are we vote? Which one are we voting on? Number two. Number two. Number two. No. Conflicted. 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 Oh. Councillor McFadden? And no. Councillor Scanner? Yes. Councillor Templeton? Aye. Okay, so for the yeses, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And for the noes, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So it's won by the yeses. And then yeah. carry on. Yeah. on to the next bit. Thank you. So then I'll put the balance of the resolutions. We're happy just to vote on this. Yep, so I'll put the balance of the resolutions. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Against? That's carried. Thank you.